Despite foreknowing whatever will be before time ever was, our all-knowing God knows they'll have to find out for themselves. It is you and I who make our own beds and have to lie in it. Did you not know that? Oddly, in a way, God's justice in righteous ways mirrors this concept. There's really an amazing community that I saw advertised in, in Tempe, Arizona, a real astounding community where cars are not allowed, where you're packed in a small area with other folks. It's called a model five-minute city sold as a place where all your dreams can tr come true. It's called Cul-de-Sac, Tempe, Arizona. Kind of reminds me of a spirit dimension. So with that, just look on your screen, and if you want more information about this place, I've put some links down in the bottom of the description. It's in Tempe, Arizona, and it is called Cul-de-Sac in Tempe, Arizona. It's the first car-free neighborhood built from scratch in the USA. Marvelous place. Welcome to Cul-de-Sac Tempe, a first car-free neighborhood from scratch. New York Times, Guardian, Wall Street Journal are, are pumping this place up big time. They're extolling it as the greatest thing since the napkin. And it, why? Because you live in a five minute city. At Cul-de-Sac Tempe, our retailers are award winners, community leaders, and visionaries. You're just five minutes away from all your essentials at the street corner, urban marker, quick time, quick a quick tune-up at uh, Archer's Bikes, and a cozy dinner at something Cochin Chihuahuas. I'm not much on Spanish. But you know, you have all your needs, and you can ride your bike, and you, all you can do is walk in this, this little teeny uh, place, and they're expanding it, making it bigger, and so you can live there for anywhere from 1400 a month to a couple of thousand a month, and you get a cracker box apartment. Man, it's, it, it is a wonderful place to live. It's a people-centered open space. Stroll along two miles of peaceful Pasos nestled between nearly 100 human scale buildings. Over 55% of the neighborhood is open space. Enjoy abundant landscaping, shade, and zero asphalt. Host a al fresco dinner for friends in an intimate courtyard. There you see the buildings. You're packed in like sardines. And if you go on the line there, you will suddenly see this place is touted as a paradise. Basically, you are boxed in. If you go back to this picture I put up here, this is an aerial shot looking down at one of those cozy courtyards. This, and then when I also perused the website, I saw the inside of some of these buildings. And since I worked in community corrections, they look the inside of a prison. <laughs> so this is a five-minute city, not a 15-minute city. This is the greatest thing. Wouldn't you like to live there? This place was created to reduce carbon emissions, a place where one will soon own nothing and be happy about it. A true worker's paradise on earth. Yep, that is, until the newness wears off and the barbed wire fences are installed and go up, and this expanded five-minute city turns into a fascist totalitarian ghetto with no air conditioning to protect you from weather change. None at all, because the newnesses wear off, and suddenly you wake up in a place that sounded great, but in reality it was anything but. You have to learn the hard way. There is wisdom in that that we make our own beds and have to lie in it. Well, you can't blame God for letting folks make their own mistakes. You really can't. God can't be fairer than that. There's no, absolutely no political system of government that can lay claim to being that fair and judicious. Instead, it's all about censorship, brutish power grabs, silencing political opponents, you know, enforced by assassinating somebody's character if you don't conform to some narrative or say the wrong pronoun. 
am I talking to you? Does that make sense? Do you live in such a world where criminals are deliberately unleashed in cities across the world? Lawlessness, depravity is extolled as the newest, most noblest of all virtues. Tax-paying citizens are footing the bill for woke agendas and against threats that the weather dares to ever change, you know? You know? Where non-citizens who broke into one's own country illegally can live free and on the county dole, yet citizens are fleeced for more tax dollars to pay for it all. Equity, that's what it's called. Equity, you know, you got to pay back for daring, daring to improve your lot in life. No redemption for you ever, never, ever at all. In fact, hate and violence will rule the roost. Families are destroyed. Have you seen that? Kids are brainwashed to be altered and people blame God for it all. I guess folks will just have to find out for themselves the cost of the knowledge of good and evil, which denies the truth that God reveals our greatest need to return back to Him by waking up and realizing, finally, that His ways are best. When you enter into the afterlife, things like this are fully explained to you, where you understand why it is important to find out for oneself how so. You see, God is absolutely fair. He shows no partiality at all. Why? Because there's no other way for God to live true to how great he really is than by allowing us to use the gifts of his to exercise the dominion that he granted us in humanity way back in the Garden of Eden. So we'll end up, and we fell, so, so we'll end up having to find out for ourselves our truest need. It is we who make hell on earth, folks. It's we who keep it alive by ignoring how God provided his own gracious ways of escape and gives us a new lease on life. People don't want that. Instead, they want their own way. You know, have that your own way. Have it your own way. You know, be rich in need of nothing attitude. Did you not know that in need of nothing means you don't even need the Lord God Almighty. This will be seen even in the churches as Revelation chapter 3 says about the Laodicean people, the Laodicean era of the church. Think about it. Jesus is standing outside the Laodicean door, knocking there for a reason. You need me? Come on. Come. Let me back in. It's no wonder God will vomit them out of his mouth. They don't want no part of him. They're rich and need of nothing. Not even God. That is the prevailing attitude of the world. The last day's hallmark that we'll, we'll see. Rich, neither nothing, not even God. Well, I guess folks are just going to find out for themselves their truest need, you know. And I did, folks. When I died, I discovered Jesus' new lease on life that he gave me. Where I found out that I need him in the midst of all the raging storms that are created by human agents, even myself, that invites the devil to come in, to right on in, to come to kill, rob, destroy, enchant, in creating this spirit dimension. For me back then, I discovered God's great undeserved mercy when he called me back to life and I came back to this old world. Because of this, I know I owe him my very life. I also know perfectly well that the things that I teach, I will come under a stricter judgment. That was drilled into me, folks. I just can't, I'll talk about that later. So I wrote my book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, from the advantage of hindsight that I had back in 2005. That's when the book came out in November. In it, I did my best to try to capture what is impossible described in some sort of linear fashion that readers could understand. I also wrote it to answer questions like why we'll have to learn for ourselves. And I tried to answer that. People complimented me on that and said that you, you know, you, you, you really made me think. You know, well, that <laughs> this experience made me think too. There's no way to describe what would be called another dimensional type of world, a spirit dimension. That is my personal name for it. I don't think I've ever heard anybody else call it that. The spirit dimension. What will one day awake to immediately after we all die? We're going to wake into the spirit dimension. Debatable as it is, I saw hell. I was unsaved at the time. I had an axe to grind against God and lived like it. No other way to say it. Then I died and found myself in the pit of hell, walking as I mentioned in parts 1 through 8 of this series, on how I entered this this spirit dimension. 
where I walked midst great terror, where the knowledge and understanding came into my mind faster than, than grease lightning, no other way to say it, where things were explained instantaneously at once, while I was walking amidst total terror, saying the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, nonstop, looking at all this. Where, and I can see people trapped inside of cube-like cells, and I can see their personal, intimate life history unfold before me. If that flooded into my mind, I can't explain it. While other things remain veiled to be later explained, like why the folks were in these cube-shaped cells. So years and years have gone by, and I always said, why did I see cubes? Why did uh, do other people who had after-death experiences who were allowed to step out of these cells describe them as cubes? So let me explain. When my book came out in 2005, I had no idea, I had absolutely no idea why there was anything like a cube. I had no knowledge that the, what the cube represented in the occult world, that it's related to Saturn, the king of the abyss. In the pit of hell, I saw people inside the cubes. Then what I saw made more sense when I found that out years and years later. But then I found out something even more profound, that if uh, this, the, a cube is made up of six sides. So if you unfold the six sides in any direction, Guess what the shape is going to be? If you unfold each one, it's going to sh side. You're going to come up with the shape of a cross. That is profound. So when you fold, unfold the six sides of a cube, its shape turns into a cross. And that is our rescue from this pla place, paid for by the blood of Jesus shed upon the cross. If anything that, that I want to try to re reiterate or why God allowed me to see hell and live to tell about it is for his glory, not mine, but also to, to tell you, you can escape these cubes of the king of the underworld that's glorified in many, many, many cities now, open in commercials and so forth, all over the place, and unfold that Hummer and you get across the design to save you from this place. No other way to say it. No other way to be nice about it. It's only by the blood of Jesus. That you, that you may not like that. By the blood of Jesus, you'll be saved from this place. That's our rescue. Paid for by the blood of Jesus, shed upon that cross. Did you know that six is the number for mankind whose life reveals whom and what they attach themselves to? And that's what life really is about. Who are you attached to? You fell, humanity fell away from God. God does everything. He, he, he like we see this a uh, background screen that I have all outdoors cries out that somebody created that. And people pay no attention to it or make their own gods or whatever. But they don't want to acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. They don't want to recognize that there's somebody there sent to rescue them. Okay? And it's and all creation reveals. There is a creator who actually cares, who loves you, who gives you and provides for you despite what you're like and what other people are like and what other people do to take it away. And God will even allow you to blame him for it all when he's not to blame at all. Many NDE experience share the same phenomena of seeing something phenomenal. And uh, the only way I can describe it is that you see all at once, inside and outside and all around in various ways. Some people report when they die, you know, like I did, you're floating up. And when you, and I went through the ceiling and stuff, I could see things going on around me. I could see the, the neighbors fighting. I could see the kids uh, kicking down the cans of the road. You know, I didn't have to turn my head any way to look. I could see all around in like a 360 degree vision as I was going up. Other people who died experienced the same thing. And, and they've been resuscitated. They came back through medical means, so forth, etc. And uh, I went on. And here I found myself in the pit of hell, seeing inside, being able to see inside of a cube, having the personal life history downloaded into me in an instant. Okay. And then I could see what it was like inside the cube, top of the cube, bottom of the cube. I, I can't explain the spirit dimension. I, I really can't. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what else to call it, a spirit dimension. And um, there's no way to explain it. And people think that you're crazy and when you try to explain it because, oh, no, we live in a linear three-dimensional world, but this is a spirit dimension. And so mine's a bit different because I saw the inside of a cube 
the victims that were inside the cube, the people who placed themselves there, they sent themselves there. And I could see from their perspective while standing on the outside, knowing full well, standing on the outside, I could see on top, bottom, bottom, I, I saw all kinds of things. And I could see what people attached themselves to and loved the most and how it cost them. And it cost them to live inside this cube. This, uh, it's far worse than any five-minute city sold to you as the best place on earth. And, and the devil will sell hell as the most beautiful place to go. All your friends are there. You heard that before? <laughs> I did the best I could in my book to explain in a linear fashion what happened. However, while it happened, I was terrified, I, 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 and I walked, I was befuddled in some sort of blank state kind of way that allowed me to take it all in while saying the name of Jesus repeatedly. I recall vividly just staring and wanting to wake up, but I could not just saying his name. I remember terrifying creatures around me. All I could say was his name, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, that he told me to say nonstop while I was there. And in some ways that I can't explain, that kept me in touch with him who spoke to me before I arrived in this pit, whom I stood there and he judged me. That judgment is uh, far um, more terrifying than, than seeing hell because you see what's really like on the inside. The Bible's true. When you die, then comes the judgment. But if it's God's will, and God's sovereign, and if he wants to bring somebody back from the abyss in his sovereign will, he certainly can. Don't let people fool you in that. Just don't. God is sovereign. I respect God's sovereignty probably more than, people, more than other people because I don't demand what his sovereignty must look like, while some people do. It was precisely like he... Uh, was speaking to me, and I call this in my book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, here, in my book here, um, it was a voice of mystery, and it's actually coming from the Lord, and he was explaining to me, uh, you know, the spirit dimension, and uh, why I was there, and it was almost like, uh, in, in a way, he was rebuking me, and these words challenged me, and led me to process more later on. Because after I came back, I was messed up. And I knew something happened. I got changed when I got saved. But I still lived in the world. I didn't know how to step out of the world. And I, and I didn't quite process all this stuff. And later when I got into the church, started to read the Bible, I started to see things that ministers were reading out of the scripture. And then all of a sudden they just jumped out of the page and grabbed me and go, this this makes sense because this is what what the Lord spoke to me while I was in this place at certain points. You have to get my book to find out how this how how I wrote this. I did it the best way to try to capture it, but it's, it I, it's just almost impossible to do. I did the best I could. And what the Lord was doing was was precisely like He was settling a score I had with Him directly. There's no other way. And he challenged me. He rebuked me. He reproved me. He nailed me. <laughs> and um, that is whew, something that, that, that makes me a little, um, a little, um, a little teary eyed a little bit here. <sighs> oh, my. Hold on, folks. Sorry about that, all that noise in the background with the mic, but my eyes start to tear up when I think about this. One of these events is I described on page 99 of my book, and it's going to help you understand um, why I said they'll just have to learn for themselves. They made their bed and lie in it. So let's look at this page of how the Lord was speaking to me in detail. I'm going to read from pages, excerpts from page 99 to 104. I'm the author of the book. I give myself permission to show you this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're going to look at my book. I'm going to turn this slide up here. I want to show you what I'm talking about. In this book, as you see, I did the best I could to underline segments of my book. And I want to show you how the Lord speaks to, to, to me there. And I tried to convey this. I wrote it in the book, how to read this. But, you know, I probably didn't, I should have probably underlined the words and maybe had a better description. 
on how to do this because they're actually sentences, real short sentences. So the Lord would speak to me in just a, a little short sentence. And as he spoke, an encyclopedia of, of warehouse full of knowledge would hit your head. There is nobody, nobody that speaks like Jesus. Nobody. Where a few words can just cut the thunder, the thoughts, the intents of your heart like that. There is no no way to describe it. And when you read the scriptures, we, we read it in this uh, Western, traditional, Eastern, whatever you are, type of fashion, whatever your culture is, and you fail to note the depths of his word. This is why when you read the Bible pages or you read something, something jumps out and grabs hold of you. The Holy Spirit's talking and it means something to you and it changes and alters your life course. This is what I'm talking about. So I tried to write this in the book. So what I did here for you in this slide, I, I put what he said, I'm going to read it, and then I go to each sentence that he spoke, and they're different. I underlined them in different colors and put numbers there so you can kind of understand what I'm saying. So these words began. That's in um, page 99. It says, do you live fruitful, live unfruitful? That's all. That's all I said. But listen to what, he, what, what came to me. I did this the best I could. Hear this. All beings were given a great precious gift. The gift is the gift of life. Ha, what have you done with this gift? Do you keep life live with fruitful things or tend life live with unfruitful things? What do we spend it on and how do we keep life live? Let's look at this in light blue there. And he said, do we live life pretending to be, hmm, justly? all alive. Whew, I'm still getting goosebumps when I read that. This is what he meant. Spend life breaking hearts. Do you keep envy alive because another may have more than we do? Or do we let jealousy live because another wrote a grander outfit than you? How do we judge an, uh, another and then ourselves? What do we do to keep life alive? Do we spend life looking at a person and determine they are a loser and will never amount to anything and make sure they are beaten on the job, scorned at home, mocked at play? Do we keep backbiting, backstabbing, brown nosing to achieve a goal while pretending to be a saint at home? Do we neglect for a price of a beer? What are we doing with this gift of life? What are, what are we spending it on? In what manner do you keep our life live? Hmm, why would God want a robber to live next door to his mansion if, if the robber still robs? Why would God want a person bent on playing mind games just to trip another up for sport to live near him? What reason would there be to trust a liar to speak the truth? Why would God want to live with such people continuously lest they can be justly reformed from erroneous ways? You once argued and many lay claim that this is unfair, that God should have known all this beforehand and done things a better way. Ah, a mystery later to be solved. He already has. You all are still alive. Others chide, as you did down at the farm, that it would be better not to exist and be a place like this. But how can this be to one made alive? Some even remark that this is but a temporary affliction. However, if a person will not listen on earth, what makes one think they'll change after eternity sets its seal? Corruption would become continuously replete. What I did is I tried my best to capture how he spoke to me with, with those italicized words. And I'm, I'm in, in this, I'm putting them in, um, I'm reading them to you, then I'm going back and reading as it unpacked the best way I could. There's a lot more. <laughs> and when I was, uh, when, when, when I was, came, came out back, I was going to church. And one of the very first things that I heard was lessons from preachers on God's sovereignty. Things like that are revealed to you in eternity in a way that you, you you're not going to blame God. You can't. There's so many people who want to blame God for making the world the way it is, but I guess you're just going to have to learn who really is messing it up, like I did. I was confronted with that fact. I'm, I'm sitting here today. I didn't think I'd get up, up upset about it, but the memories come back. They're making me tear up right now, but I'm going to keep going. Just listen to what the Holy Spirit says from, to you. That's all I can say. Let's go back. On page 100, 
While these transcending thoughts went on speaking, I began remembering how I debated against the existence of God. My favorite arguments concerned the unfairness of God creating a world as it is with all its pain and misery. According to my view, God would have foreseen everything and designed life a better way. I often made the comment that if God really made punishment eternal, eternal, this was unfair due to the reason that God designed the universe and therefore made evil evil. How could God hold anyone to account since he was the author of all things? Now I began discovering that my arguments and answers were wrong. Before me, <laughs> that crass, ugly, beastly guide limped onward, desperately trying to shield its ears from hearing this word. You know, trying to explain, this all happened at once. I'm walking, I'm just taking a few steps. This is what comes into your mind. I'm looking at this beast, looking inside cells. I could get a download real quick on somebody, turn around and then uh, look, uh, if I'm walking alongside the road, looking at the tornado vortexes and the heat and, uh, and, and, and stuff rising from the ground and the, and the smell of this place and the sounds, saying Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, looking at this thing. I call him Lizard Breath, and he's holding his hands to his ears, trying not to hear what the voice was saying. He didn't like the voice. He couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> Amen. Amen for Jesus. Amen for the Word of God. Let every man learn about the Word of God. Let every woman learn about the Word of God. I have some respect for it. And then I heard the word, order, order, twice in a different way. First was order, and the second was order, like a question mark, like one word sentences, and here's what came to me. Answers you once thought that understood the order were found lacking wisdom's decree. What then is the answer, and what is designed to restore order? You once proudly proclaimed non-existence would be better fate. Here, here, I'll grant you clues and riddles from the wise, like solving a puzzle discovered a piece at a time. Your first clue, God is a God of the living, as the good book says. What I learned from this, God has an order. He designed creation to be functional for good. And what we have to find out for ourselves. You may not like this answer, but this is a perfectly just God would have to let you decide a matter. And then he'll do everything to redeem you, to prove how good he is in the process. But still, if you make the wrong decisions, this is, the fate is inside of a cube. No other way around it. You made your bed and you will lie in it. There's no other way people can learn his order. When you find out what it's like without his order governing things. When you have another order coming in, like the devil's order that creates chaos, lets criminals in the street, loosen the street, open borders, everything that the liberal, democratic, communist party, liberal, uh, progressive, whatever party is in, 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 in your country, rule the roost, hell was unleashed. When you have order, I'm, I'm also including rhino Republicans, too. You know? It doesn't matter. And politicians are just greasy, okay? <laughs> Very few of them I even trust. But anyway, and let's get off the political. This is, this is, uh, this is, you have to learn that God has an order. It was created good, and he's going to get us back to that. But you made your bed and lie in it. And, you, and there's no other way for you to learn the knowledge of good and evil. Think. Think real hard what I just said. This is where I learned this. <laughs> Jesus was speaking to me in this place. It was like my only connection with, with anything. And there was a point at the end when that connection was broken. And I'll talk about that maybe next week or the week after. I'll talk about some other things too. I'm going, this is a very deep dive into my book. Okay? And I put number two down there. This is the second thing he said. It's in light blue underline. God brings forth life, a living way to a foregone conclusion design. So this is what it means. Everything God does brings forth life and keeps life alive, truly alive, because every plan creates a living way and is carried to a foregone conclusion. To blast one off into non-existence would not be a living way and defies the logic of a life-giving creator, though it could be done. Instead, a place where just punishment issues forth would be a living way designed where all could look and see a land best forgotten, but not left unseen. 
all in due time. When these things came to me, I had no knowledge of what Ecclesiastes says, that God put eternity in their hearts. I knew nothing about salvation. I knew nothing about being sealed by the Holy Spirit. But I knew when I was judged, I was sealed in my condemned state. And I know perfectly well hell was where I was going to go. There was no, um, this, this, was, this, was, this was where I deserved to be. I couldn't wiggle my way out of it. I couldn't justify it and, and say, God, you're the oppressor and I'm the victim. So you got to let me into heaven to not to, to be an oppressor. That, that, that won't slide with God. He'll show you that you are the oppressor by, by trying to pit his character traits against each other. He'll show you that while you're standing there being judged in an instant. It happens so fast in the spirit dimension. In the spirit dimension, this is, Jesus would speak just a few words, and these things would unpack, and there's a lot more and so than, than what I had wrote here that are in this. And, this. and I wrote it down the best I could remember it, trying to make it make sense to you, editing it. Man, it was, it was, it was, it was a job to do. And I did the best I could. And so um, any of the mistakes in it are mine. I can't do anything about it, but I just had to write it in a way that people could understand and try to capture what it was like. Just a few words being said, all this stuff unpacking and, and challenging you and provoking you that we destro destroyed God's order and design. We're here, uh, you know, I guess we're just going to have to learn that his ways are best because we mess things up. Let's go back to the book here. And then when I was reading this here, that I would see a land best forgotten but not left unseen all in due time. This was said to me s several times there. And uh, I think it was a, a minister that went through a teaching on the book of Revelation or chose the verse about the lake of fire being seen off. You know, there was a lake of fire in the future. I mean, that, that hit me like a ton of bricks. That's the land best forgotten. <laughs> but not to be left unseen. That's what death and hell, Hades, hell itself is going to be cast into it at an appointed time called the white throne. This is according to Revelation chapter 20. It's all scriptural. And it's there to remind us of something. He provides a way of escape. And this is where this goes. He, he's telling me he provides a way of escape. <laughs> this, he, he was challenging me. He, 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 was, he was, how would you say, uh, graciously angry, as that sounds like a oxymoron, <laughs> I can be graciously anger. Uh, I, I tried to capture that. I don't think I did a very good job in the book, but I, I tried. <laughs> Let's see how. I wrote it in blue. Do you think one most high, so cruel to let souls be punished forever? Would you still think that after learning he provided a living way to escape this fate, he offers a way to escape? Yes, refining fire of a way to sort the chaff from the wheat that is truly fair, absolutely just, and profoundly, mercifully wise. Let me go back and explain what he said. Most high, provided living way, escape. Truly fair, absolutely just, and profoundly, mercifully wise. When he said that to me, I was being rebuked because he was challenging me. Do you think God is so cruel that souls be punished forever? Boy, Brian, you argued that. Would you still think so after learning he provided a living way of escaping this fate? He offers a way to escape, yes, a refining fire of a way to sort the chaff from the wheat that is truly fair, absolutely just, and profoundly, mercifully wise. Listen closely, listen well, here a little, there a little, one piece at a time. You have a second chance if you can see first born in humanity and then sealed in by eternity. The Most High has provided a manner of escape, but oh, how few accept the offer. The sorting has begun. So later, when I became a Christian and I heard messages on the parable of the sower and, uh, and uh, about that, and he talked at the end time the, about it'll be... The, it'd be like somebody sorting out the bad fruit from the good fruit or the f bad fish from the good fish. The angels go around and take out, throw away the tares and separate the wheat from the chaff. So I didn't know that was in the Bible. And when I wrote this, I did. Because I wrote it with hindsight now that I understood. Um, my. So this happened in 1980. And this, I wrote part of this stuff down right after it happened. Wrote a, a, after, I think it was 88 or, or whatever, I wrote my first 40-page manuscript because I couldn't write or describe what actually happened. 
I couldn't quite describe the spirit dimension very well, what was going on. And I prayed about it, and I didn't. I just gave up. And all of a sudden, the Lord told me to write it, and it all came to me. And I had to struggle with trying to convey what it's like to live in a spiritual dimension, have the Lord speak to you in a few sentences, how it unpacked to you, how it rebuked me and reproved me with my grand arguments, how smug and smart I really was, which I wasn't at all. I was dumb as a post, ignorant, and find myself walking in the pit of hell. Let's go back and look at this. So I wrote these, there are three things he says. He said, offer, live, offer, life, offer, exchange, sorting. What does that mean? I'll talk about that in a minute. So let's go to number one. So when he said offer, this is what, he, what it meant. And I wrote it the best I could. What's the offer? It's a new purpose for your life. A second chance to live truly and profoundly live. Plus, a manner of escape from this downward loam. The offer, his life that teaches you to live a yielding yes and not a defiant no. That seeks only more and more and more. God wants an exchange. Life for life. His life for yours. I want to start crying. This just really hurts me sometimes to read this. This brings back a lot of memories, <laughs> folks. So why, why do so few accept the offer? The answer would be surprising. All you have to do is look within yourself at what life you keep alive to find your answer. I got tears welling up in my eyes. Hold on, gotta get them out so I can read this. Um, many arrive here in this place because they would not depart from the old life and were not willing to rescind it or let it go. Instead, they all chose to maintain what they thought was keeping their life alive and now receive recompense in full. The Most High hates seeing this. He weeps for each that perishes here. He extends the offer freely to all who will listen and hearkens to the exchange. Would you? <laughs> and honestly answer, I would say no, with a few cuss words, expletives in it, for emphasis. That's how God rebuked me. <laughs> how would you like the Lord speak to you like that? Calling you on the carpet? walking in the pit of hell, seeing all this stuff, not understanding why you're seeing it. No, you know, you know you deserve this place, and you know you're going to a destination that you didn't want to go. And you know everything he said to you before you got there, an option, uh, a returning is an option still yet to be decided. When you arrive, say my name and my title. You know, all that stuff. I tried to be brutally honest in this book as best I could. Because I'm revealing a lot of myself in it. Maybe I'm really revealing some of your, some of you too. So he said, offer life, offer an exchange. Okay, this next part. These powerful thoughts challenged me. This is below number three there. These powerful thoughts challenged me. All I could do was recall how often I have made fun of this exchange and derided those who believed it. I never had anyone ever really logically explain it or as need tell this point. I remember how I mocked Trisha. That's a, 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 a composite character that's based on a real person. When she told me a sim similar discourse long ago, suddenly here I was faced directly with the reality of the offer. And then, and then he went again. So it's offer, exchange, and sorting. Offer, exchange, and sorting. Okay. Will you exchange your life for his life? There is no other way to find life that many seek, so the sorting can be complete. I recall how you mock many of God's servants concerning how one makes this kind of exchange. Old life for new life. You scoffed it off as fable and superstitious myth. Let me continue. Remember, offer, exchange, sorting. What does that mean? New life would necessitate being reborn, not in a manner of flesh and blood, but rather in the manner of God's Spirit. His life reblown inside you, like on the day humanity was created, when new life was imposed, thus placing eternity in the heart of mankind. This new seal inside one's heart governs with living instruction and guidance teaching, one the new path to walk that makes life really live, where assigned. Live life with living instructions and guidance teaching. Live unique without doubt. <laughs> and this is what it meant. 
You once derided how the offer was attained with questions of validity by crying loudly how all roads lead to the same end. There is only one unique path, one profoundly marked road, an absolute way. Why? So you'll know without doubt you're on the correct road. The Most High marked this path distinctly and you once questioned it with scorn. Will you listen now concerning how? I'm just kind of getting a little choked up, folks. This brings back memories of being rebuked by the Lord with a gracious rebuke. Angry at me. He was rebuking me. While I'm walking in this pit, staring at all this crazy stuff I was seeing. Understanding and seeing it at the same time. I can't explain to looking inside these cubes. I can see the inside of the cube standing from the outside, and I can see what it was like in the inside as I passed by, this creature in front of me, all these creatures around me, the spiral pit of hell, and the uh, open area with these tornado vortexes coming in. Often we'd walk between the cubes, squeeze between them, go back into the back recesses. How would you think that makes you feel? <laughs> if he resurrected you, wouldn't you say, I owe him my life? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for having mercy on me. Those words are not trite words, not least to me. There was a, um, a sinner and a Pharisee saying, I'm justified, I'm so good, I look at myself, all my great things I've done. But this guy said, Lord, I'm a sinner, be merciful to me. And who do you think will be justified? The sinner who said, be merciful to me, because he sees himself. That's what was happening to me in hell. That's why I always teach that hell uncovers your true nature. Your true sin nature comes out. You become worse. You don't become reformed. You become what? Your total debased nature if it's loud out. Most people have, God, well, put it this way. There's a law written in our hearts called a moral conscience. So we are able to do good. It's not a question that people can't do good. It's the fact is we can't maintain what is good. Even in my sinful, wicked ways in my pagan days there, running around drinking and smoking and running around with those who do and getting crazy and fights and everything else and doing stupid things. I did some good things, you know. Um, obviously, I'm capable of being but, good, but I could not maintain any goodness. And no human being, listen to me now, can maintain goodness. You're not perfect. There is no way, and I heard this from when, when I was working as a, or not working, but as a moderator on Apologetics Christian website, Evidence for God from Science many years ago, and website, and as a moderator answering questions and stuff, so forth, these people say, well, I studied the Bible extensively, well, and I always would ask them, you know, are you perfect? And they say, no, I'm not perfect. So how can you say that if you're not perfect, you study at least extensively and you know everything? Do you know Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? I had them off at the path. And they go, oh, well, I thought you, and they get real mad. Some of them get super mad when you, when you do that. I just, I just remember the words of the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm going to penetrate. I'm going to use the word of God. I'm going to get into their heart. So I, I use Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, saying that, there's coming to Eve, there's one that's going to come to crush the serpent's head. That's Jesus. The devil knew that, that was going to happen. So what do you expect the enemy to do? To shout the loudest, right? That he's going to send his person around. He's going to hijack the word El and Elohim out of, out of different religions, because those were just generic words back then for God back in the day, ancient times, he would do that, pervert it, and have his material out there to trick you to say, I studied this extensively. But did you know that Jesus came through the cross and crushed the serpent's head? Probably not. Let's continue. I'll go to the last couple of sentences here. The Most High marked this path distinctively, and you once questioned it with scorn. Will you listen now concerning how? This is what he said. On page 102, with this question, a quiet hush suddenly filled this horrible place, creating an eerie ambiance. Here you felt separated from life, love, hope, and the breath of life these breathe. Instead, you felt total isolation, remoteness from all hope, utter fear, separation from the nature of life itself. The rebukes I received from these powerful thoughts brought a sense of connection to the life and hope from the missing world above. Without these interventions, I would have perished. 
And then in a thunderous accord, the imposing word began again with intent to restore me. That's why I said they had an intent to restore. That's what the word of God does. The word of God is more powerful, cuts to, to the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He came to restore and reconcile you back to God, not to leave you in a condemned state, but you're just going to have to learn for yourself, I guess. If you don't want it, he'll let you have at it. Bye. Just the way you want life, he'll turn a nation over to the hell they create for it. You don't want to listen to him about how to, how to be a loving husband and a loving wife and how to take care of your kids and raise them right? Your family's going to be broken. Divorce will reign. All hell breaks loose. Leave people's lives for, in your family line will be messed up. Keep spreading around. Drinking, drugs, whatever. You may be fine, but three or four generations later, there is a genetic effect that happens. Well... You're not perfect, are you? But God's here to restore your life. He, he will forgive you all those things. He wants you back. How do I know? Let's keep looking at page 102. Hmm. When the offer be offered naturally as faith comes to a child, this is the offer, or obtainable as work earned by ob obligatory demands, if given as a work to be earned, look at what we do we're employed. Policy and practice is easily preached, but never followed exactly as intended. You could write your own ticket, but you would only get lost in a bureaucratic maze, trying forever to obtain what's in the offer without a true exchange. This is, this is where the restoration began. Listen. Yes, you were disputing that all roads lead to the same conclusion not so long ago when discussing seeds becoming hay and hay into seeds your claim was wise but faulty in intelligence and given to keep smugness alive thus avoiding the exchange let's settle this contention between you and me by the logic of your own discourses all roads lead to the same end how would one know they're on a correct road unless there is a true mark to prove one is on the correct path leading to eternal life proclaimed in the offer a person would need something uniquely different, unlike any road before, a sign. So with that, when he says a sign, and this is what came to my mind, and I did the best I could to capture it, even though I, this is so weak. Should this mark be made broad or narrow, what would be best to gain your attention? A broad mark anyone can make display bureaucratic details, or a narrow mark that directly points out the right road, avoiding every chance of becoming lost in a maze due solely to its uniqueness. What is that? A sign. Simple, narrow arrow. A name, a title, unique. That's all he said. But this is what it meant. What should the sign be like? Well, opposite the manner one thinks, and very different than work bureaucratic details. Instead, a simple, narrow arrow, smoothly pointing out the offer, that second chance, life eternal sealed, a way of escape from the land best forgotten but not left unseen, life for life exchange. What is it? A name, a title, truly, really unique. Jesus told me to say his name and his title. I've been saying it all along because he gave me permission to. What else can I say? That's how I felt connection. And then I'd drift back and walk in hell some more and see more things, and he would challenge me a little bit more. And I'll get to that part next week or the next couple of weeks and finish the series out. Well, let's look at this again. Yes, you were there disputing that all roads lead to the same conclusion not so long ago when discussing seeds becoming hay and hay unto seeds. Your claim was wise but faulty in intelligence and given to keep smugness alive, avoiding the exchange. I wrote in my book and in, in the introductory chapters how my aunt and uncle and I discussed <laughs> creationism. And I said... To, by Darwin's theory, a random chance, and my uncle interrupted me and said, Brian, where does where did the first seed come from? I never was able to answer it, and I can't answer it to this day. I can't answer it now because Jesus made the flowers that made the first seed. He created creation first. That's the answer. No other way. You can't have a flower first without the seed. You can't have a chicken. You can't have an egg without a chicken because there's no chicken to lay on the egg for it to hatch. Okay? You know, um... <laughs> Random chance is bogus. There is a creator. That's what he was saying. Let's settle this contention between you and me by the logic of your own discourse. All, discourse, all roads lead to the same end. 
How would one know they're on the correct road unless there is a true mark to prove one is on the correct path leading to eternal life proclaimed in the offer? Recall the offer was an exchange, your life for his life. I can't live my life, Lord. Look what I'm making out of it. I guess I, I just had, I lived and I learned and I made a mess of things. Okay, that's the offer, an exchange. He offered his life and exchanged it for ours. He died in our place. He died for our sins. He died for your, people don't like the word sin, to be called sinners. Okay, you're not perfect. He died for your imperfection, dummy. Okay, I'm going to speak to you. You're not perfect. You're not. You know it. You can't maintain goodness 100% of the time. You're not perfect. We have a tendency to destroy goodness, haven't you? You're not going to get an A for effort, and God doesn't judge on a bell curve. He says, I died for you. I provided for you. I gave you food, water, life itself. What in the world did you do with it? When that hits you square in the face, you're going to go, wow, yeah, I am a sinner. I, I, what sin means? I, I missed the mark. I missed the mark of maintaining God's order, design, and, and goodness. I'm incapable of it. All I do is screw it up. I need help. So the exchange is, I give you my life, Lord, because you gave me yours. I want to be in you, you and me, so that we can be together always in eternity. I want to be sealed by the Holy Spirit. I want to learn how to walk in your ways, your truth, your life. It's a process. I will stumble. I will fail. I will mess things up. But by your grace, you chasing me i get back on track this is called sanctification and sanctification is not separate from salvation it's part of it there are several ways you can become sanctified you can become saved like the thief on the cross and instantly sanctified by going to heaven in just an instant that's how gracious god is but most of us don't have a thief on the cross moment of dying and on our deathbed confession, confess Jesus. No, you're going to go through a process and you don't know why you're going through what you're doing because nobody teaches this anymore. Sanctification has become a dirty word. Yeah, we know that we're not going to be sinlessly perfect in this life and sanctification gets us on this road and what sanctification does exposes our heart so we can get it healed up. After all, don't believe me. Isaiah chapter 61 that Jesus quoted in Luke chapter 4 and in Matthew as well. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and the Holy Spirit has been given to you too, to give good news to the poor in spirit, or the crushed in spirit, and to heal what? Your shattered life, your broken heart. Sanctification begins the process of real, realizing that you screwed up, you've been hurt, you've been damaged, and the Lord taking care of it by the exchange. Is it painful? Yeah, to be rebuked by the Lord, chastening. Yeah, at least I know God loves me. I've been to the woodshed so many times. I know he loves me. He doesn't kick me out. I don't live my life like the devil. I don't go to bars. I don't go drinking. I don't go smoking dope. I don't do those things. I'm thankful that I don't. I know that I couldn't do it without him living within me through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the exchange. What should this sign be like? Well, the opposite of the manner one thinks and very different than work bureaucratic details instead a simple narrow arrow splendidly pointing out the offer the second chance life eternal seal and a way of escape from the land best forgotten not left unseen life for life exchange what is it a name jesus quite simple christ or messiah truly unique with that do you really understand what jesus did for us do you feel a little pool in your heart that you might need to come to christ something in your life you feel like you need to give up but you can't why don't you ask the lord why do i do this why do i do this why do i need this uh, addiction well i'm trying to escape escape what escape what you may not like what he reveals because it may have to witness a trauma in your life or bring back a memory you don't but he'll he'll walk you through it he walks you through it when you read the word. He'll reveal things to you. He takes you one step at a time, real slow and easy. He's still doing it in my life. I'm not, I'm a <laughs> work in progress in more ways than one. <laughs> but from my experience, I learned to be real and honest before the Lord. 
warts and all. I can't hide nothing. Your audience knows me. <laughs> and a lot of times when I'm praying, he'll speak to me the same way, just a few words. And I just listen to, listen, it'll unpack. And a lot of it comes from when I'm reading the Bible. He'll bring something to my attention. And it alters the course of my life to go a different direction. And when I don't, boy, I mess things up. I'd rather take Jesus' way of escape than my own, get lost in a bureaucratic maze of New Age philosophy and ideas of, and have to do this and that and, and work real hard to take over the world and, and, and make a better place and all that. No, you're just going to have to learn and live on your own. That You can't do that. It ain't going to work. People behind you are going to come up and rob and kill and destroy it. That's why I can't wait till Jesus comes back, makes things right on this planet, sets up his millennial kingdom. I got a future. I got a hope. What do you got? Works? Effort? Trying to be good enough? Would you like your goodness, the, what you can, goodness that you're capable of, would you like to have it count for something? You need to come to Christ. Because the only goodness you have is to him, him working through you to maintain some semblances of goodness in your life on an ongoing basis and forgiving you when you screw up. Because you can't maintain it. There's no such thing as being sinlessly perfect without sin in this life. Sin means missing the mark. You blow it. That's all sin means. I missed the mark. I'm not perfect. So God, when you're going to make demands that God must accept you because you're not perfect, he could have, because he's all loving and kind, boy, that is a must smugness and pride. And I'm speaking to one who is once bound by that smugness and pride. I'm saying forsake it. That is not right. You're not perfect. You know it. Why can't you just come to Jesus Christ and say, forgive me, have mercy upon me. I am a sinner. I miss it all the time. I'm not perfect. Help me change. I want this exchange. I can't live my life. My, I'm damaged goods. I need your healing. I need mercy. I need forgiveness. He set me free. He can set you free of whatever it is that you're bound to. And just remember the one who came and sent to rescue you out of this mire. He's reaching for you now. All you have to do is cry out to them, Lord, save me. Have mercy on me. I need you. I'm coming back to you. Can you do that now? With that, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to put my contact information on the screen and how to contact me, how to provide support for me. And also, the, my first book is A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion's on there. Second book is coming out sometime up to May 7th. It could be sooner than that. I do not know. Also, if anybody solicits you from a private email soliciting money from you, that is not me. Report it to me immediately so I can find out who it is or report at least to the authorities to stop it. With that, you guys be blessed in Jesus' name.